Hello everyone, I'm so excited to share with you a little project that we've been working on. To showcase the power and beauty of African literature, we asked you which book we should read on YouTube. You gave us many options, but now we have a clear winner. And the winner is an interesting exploration of life, culture and humor. The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives is a delightful and poignant story. I hope you'll enjoy listening to over 30 Africans from all over the continent read the book out to you. There is something special about a mother bathing her child, so I have decided to bathe my daughter. I want to wipe away that woman's handprints and reclaim my daughter. This Segi was not the daughter who left that night. We had been waiting impatiently for her return. The children's foreheads were pressed against the glass sliding door. I could not sit, so I perched on the edge of my armchair. When the pickup drove into the compound, the windscreen brought a piece of the sun with it. The children jumped up and down as if their feet were made of rubber. Baba Segi had hardly opened the door of the pickup when they covered Segi with their hands. They all wanted to touch my Segi. The food was not meant for you, child. It wasn't meant for you. It was as if I'd gone mad. She watched me as I tore my dress from the neck to the hem. I slapped the walls and I scratched my face. I boxed my breast and I pulled my hair. I could not control myself. Segi knelt in the bathtub, slowly shaking her head. Then as quietly as she had started, she said, Mama, I am cold. Please bring me a towel. The story continues. Later that night, Babasegi staggered down the wide corridor that the wives' bedrooms were cut from, like he always did. He caressed Yesegi's door on the right, touched the knob on Yatope's door on the left. He listened for voices at Yefemi's door and finally paused at the threshold of Bolanli's room. He didn't knock. He just pushed the door open with his toe and brightened the room with the corridor light. He wanted to see how much Bolanle had prepared herself for him. He wanted to know if she had covered her nakedness with a cloth, like the other wives did, or if she was wearing those accursed pajamas. His eyes caught the pink sleeves, so he let out a short, sharp breath through flared nostrils. He often wondered why a woman would want to get dressed to bed like a man, but he never mentioned it lest he appeared uncivilized. Every time I have suggested that we consult herbalists and prophets, you call them con men and you have rubbished their powers. Well, he inhaled deeply and raised his eyebrows. I have thought long and hard about it, and I think we should go to the hospital to talk to a doctor. He paused, expecting Balani to reject his proposal, but she just stared ahead, mindlessly throwing nuts into her mouth. Tomorrow at 6 a.m. then. With this, he hoisted himself onto his feet using the bedpost for support and prayed that morning would wake them all. By the time Baba Sigi arrived at his workshop, his shop assistants were waiting by the giant padlock. Their greetings were met with a dismissive grunt, and they swapped knowing glances. It was going to be one of those days when Baba Sigi would sit stone-faced in the back room with his head held up by his fist. Baba Sigi knew it too. He sat at his desk, reached into a drawer, and brought out the photograph Bulandli had pressed into his palm the day they met. As he thumbed away the film of dust on it, he thought how much her personality had changed, how she'd slowly lost her meeks. After a few minutes, she got up and fled the room. Baba Sigi felt his stomach growling and made to grab the bowl of hand wash water. He missed the bowl completely and covered the cream colored rug with his undigested supper. Iyasegi and Iyatopi ran to his side and fluttered around him like harried hens. They lifted Baba Sigi by his arms gutted him to his bedroom, and covered him with a light sheet. 
leaving Ia Femi to salvage the rug with soapy water and detol. Looking back, now that two years have passed, I realize how naive I was to expect a warmer welcome. I was foolish to think I would just be an insignificant addition when in reality, I was coming to take away from them. With my arrival, 2.33 nights with Baba Segi became 1.75. His affections, already thinly divided, now had to be spread amongst four instead of three. The women have not changed. Iatope is still cordial, even kind, when I'm alone in the house with her. She doesn't say much except when she's talking about hair. Her eyeballs bounce around in their sockets and she uses her fingers to draw hairstyles in thin air. I often ask her to describe them again, just to hear a friendly voice that belongs to another grown woman. The other two are a different story, so she doesn't make the mistakes I made. One day, they will all accept me as a member of this family. One day, I will have a child of my own, and everything will fall into its place. My husband will delight in me again, the way he did before my barrenness ate away at his affection. My father soon appeared, dangling a bunch of keys from his forefinger. Bonlale, it's only eyes that have special powers that see you these days, eh? His face was smeared with that mellow smile of his, and I wondered if he was truly glad to see me or if his cheeriness was gene-induced. He normally had at least four shots warming his belly by mid-morning. I was just here a few days ago, Baba, I replied, feigning indignation at his accusations. And before then, he mockingly had his head back to take a good look at me. I'm not as old as I look, you know. He liked these games. When we were children, he liked to amuse himself by making us articulate our hatred for things using new words. I loathe bread and I despise onions, I would say. Lara would follow with, I just don't like mama at all. Segun was driving and his mother was in the front seat. They honked for the guard to swing the gates open. Even though she might have been nearing 60, Segun's mother's skin glistened like the flesh of a popo sliced open. Her nose was straight and her neck was long and distinguished. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so the secret, the secret lives of Baba Segi's wives. Read with me. I remember a saying from my childhood. Only a foolish man falls into a trap prepared with his own hands. It is because of what happened to my father that these words were on everyone's lips. My father was a hunter, but he'd caught his foot in the snares he'd laid for an antelope. They say he heard the squawk of a wild guinea fowl and ran after it, forgetting what was in front of him. His ear led him to an early death. Teacher said I was right to possess her. He bought me two shots of whiskey and patted me on the shoulder. Not a fleck of jealousy, not a speck of envy. I tell you, the man is to be admired. Who's next? Thank you very much. Farewell. Taju heard the sound of vomiting but only realized the source of it when Baba Segi staggered to the open door of the pickup. His breakfast had formed a colorful bib of his gleaming white shirt. Take me to the teacher, he ordered. His eyes were bloodshot as if he'd been weeping blood. A few minutes before, Daju had seen Ia Segi leaving the building. 
Her feet were all over the place like an inebriated dancer's. She blew her nose into the headscarf she clutched. Taju's first instinct was to hide, but he resisted and walked towards her. Iasegi, are you not going back with us? He asked. No, I'm going home by myself, Taju. My husband knows. Her shame was complete. The mere sight of Taju made her filthy. Your husband knows what? That his children are not his children? Did you mention my name? Iasegi stopped in her tracks and jerked her head. He took intermittent deep breaths and wondered if life could drain him if he drew one deep enough. When Baba Segi put the money in Taju's hand, he clutched his driver's small fingers and looked deep into his face. Taju flinched and pulled away, but Baba Segi didn't relinquish his fingertips. Will you not give me my keys before you go? He was completely unaware that Taju's bladder was brimming. Two years since I've been living in Baba Segi's house, he has never apologized for his mistakes. He makes peace his own way, and it involves tattered brown envelopes, bursting with 50 naira notes thrust beneath doors at dawn. I'd been ruffled by the red thread incident, and I could think of no better way to calm myself than to spend the day at the Shongo market. I decided to visit the bric a brac store around lunchtime. My intention was to buy something really ostentatious, like a copper plate. But when I got there, I found neither bell nor bell ringer. You better keep walking, a woman who sat with her back turned to me warned. The police might be watching from afar to see who comes looking for him. Keep walking. We are talking about stolen property, you know. The woman was unpacking cheap platinum pans and cutting up cardboard boxes with a giant pair of tailor scissors. She didn't turn around to face me. When the fire died, I gathered the scattered shreds that remained, dug a hole in the, in the warm soil and buried them. Back in my bedroom, I surveyed the open spaces that rolled out before me. Now there will be room for a cot, I thought. Hmm. Dr. Dibia was shorter than most men, but he made up for it with a big bulk. He had a short afro and his thick lenses were framed with heavy rectangular rims. When I walked into his office, he asked me to sit down and made me wait for him to finish the page he was reading. Pardon me, he said, as he inserted a tattered leather bookmark between his, its pages. Only then did he pick up my file to mouth every word in it. So have you bought the test results? He stretched out his hand without looking at me and eagerly tore at the envelope with a steel letter opener. While he read, I glanced at his desk. All his stationery was coordinated. The letter opener, the stapler, and the staple remover were made from leather and shiny copper. Dr. Dibia summoned a nurse and instructed her to prepare me. I wondered why he avoided my eyes and concluded that he must be bashful. He muttered to himself as I lay waiting behind the white curtain. There were eight new doorbells on the pillar, each one labeled. Another of the landlady's modern innovations, I thought, wondering how my mother would cope with having to walk out to open the gate every time their bell rang. I pressed the bell that had a combi printed on it. Shall we see what happens next? Here we go. On the day Baba Segi was to cut off his bad harvest, my father sat on a stool outside his hut and stared at the miserable baskets, six in number. His legs were stretched out in front of him and his chin rested on his walking stick. When I surfaced from my mother's hut to slice okra, I greeted him. He didn't respond, but followed me with his eyes. It made me feel so self-conscious that I took my okra back into my mother's hut. Soon afterwards, Baba Segi's pickup appeared at the end of the dusty road. My father shouted my name and instructed me to turn out a large mound of amala to be 
accompanied by a foe, made from the freshest spinach leaves I could find. I would have happily given up my nights as well. There were weeks I ached so much I could hardly sit. Get pregnant quickly, or he will start to force feed you bitter concoctions from medicine men until your belly rumbles in your sleep, she said. I wonder what will happen next. This time, she aimed well. She hit me in a soft spot. So painful was it that I raised my palms to my face and pressed out tears like pus from a wound. She hadn't finished yet. She stopped to catch her breath and continued. Has it been so hard for you and your sister to honor me? All I wanted was for you both to do well. But no, you want your mother to die of sadness. Let me tell you, Bolali, I don't just sit here. I beg God daily to forgive my sins, even though I don't know what they could be. I have asked myself a million times, what evil sins have I committed to bring curses upon myself? I smiled to myself and hurried on, tickled by the playful finger of young love. I heard the footsteps gaining on me, but I ignored them. I didn't want to turn around and find it was just some poor woman rushing home, clutching a Bible and a toddler. Apart from that, I was determined not to let anything knock me off my high. I hadn't felt such liberty in a long time. It was only when the voice breathlessly shouted, Wait, please, that I swung around. Good evening, Seggy. She didn't just want me to slow down. She wanted me to stop. She slowed down before she reached me, urging me to stop. Auntie, auntie, please don't tell. Mama will kill me. I exhaled. My exhilaration had vanished and a sense of weariness came over me. Not more household intrigue. Could I bear it? Don't tell her what? Don't tell my mother that you saw me at the palm wine shed. Don't tell my father you saw me with a boy. Seggy flung her fingers in the air as if to shake the weightness off of them. She was hopping from foot to foot and her mouth was open with supplication. My heart went out to her. I won't say a word. I must have given in too easy. Either that or she just didn't believe me. Please, auntie, please, I beg you, auntie, I'll do anything. Ah. Hmm. Do not commit adultery, I tell them. Follow the path that is good and right, I say. And when they forget to do their homework, I ask them, if they want to be educated ladies or useless tubers with arms and legs. They giggle when I say this. One day, I thought and shared it with them. I said it would probably be, 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 be it, I said it would probably be better for me to hang myself after they marry and leave home. They crumpled into a pile on the floor and wept. Mama, we would never leave you here, they cried. They understood so much more than I ever did. Like I said, they have stomachs in their eyes. Bonale does not deserve the treatment the other wives give her. Don't! They bark at her as if she were a child. Don't sit there and don't touch that.
all day long. They are at it. Then quite unexpectedly, the plant is uprooted and pulsing at my fingertips. I do not open my eyes. I don't want to see Baba Segi looking at me. Nine years ago, I came home from the farm to find Baba Shaggy sitting in my father's heart. I was 23 years old, I remember. It was later in the year that my older brother declared that I was ripe for marriage. My mother did not tell him to mind his mouth. Instead, without raising her face from the heap of melon seeds, she added, truth be told, she is bordering on decay. Hmm. I cannot forget that day. Not because their words did not cost me sorrow, but because I remember thinking how unjust it was that the gods has blessed them with such wondrous eyes. How was it that they could see the womanhood that I, on whose body it was plastered, could not? Within me, I was certain I was still a child. I fought like a child and enjoyed childish pleasures, like pursuing ants as they carried away sugar lumps and scratching hardened scabs from the edge of my old wounds. I was frustrated too. No water meant no weeds. Since the sun denied me my joy that year, I hid under the pile of mats at home, as far away from its rot as possible. It was only when I heard the wind carrying voices home from the forest path that I abandoned my hiding place to help them ease calabashes of their heads. My father's wife snared at my helpfulness and my mother hid her face from behind her wrapper. When the woman who came to collect me arrived, they eagerly told her I was an untamed animal. They told her to watch me lest my madness drive me to bite the bark off neighborhood trees. There aren't many trees where we live, the woman said. And if they were, she would be too busy sweeping the leaves under them. As they drove me away, I glared at my uncle through the rear window and licked my lips. He should have known I would return one day. But that is the problem with evildoers. She didn't even permit her driver to take me. She said such luxury would make me aspire to a status that was beyond me. The top of my head was baking and I could feel the warm sand through the holes in my flip-flops. Queen. When a plan does not go right, you plot again. One day you will succeed. One day you will be able to damage the person who hurts you so completely that they will never be able to recover. I have told Iyasegi this on several occasions. I keep telling her that we need to find a permanent solution, but she does not have wisdom. She says we should continue to humiliate Bolanle until she runs away. Let us cut her feathers, she says. Well, the bird has shown that she can fly without feathers. I knew we should have gone for her throat. We should have bled her into a hole in the earth. <sighs> I have suffered too much in my life to let that rat spoil it all for me. So what if she's a graduate? When we stand before God on the last day, will he ask whether we went to university? <laughs> no but he will want to know if we were as wise as serpents. You have spoken well, Iafemi. You have spoken the truth. I shut the vehicle door firmly. 
I waited by the roadside until they were out of sight before crossing. I had no intention at all of going to see my parents. I wanted to see what the market had in store for me. Sango Market was in a long, muddy street. Shielded from the sun, the colours under the stalls, rusted iron sheets blended into a collage of dreary hues. The oranges dulled into maroon. The violets and greens merged into navy blue. Wading through the stalls amidst perspiring flesh was exhausting, but I was not deterred. I strode directly to the crockery section. My little pleasures were of utmost importance now. Since they angered Obasheki and made him storm out of my bedroom. It wasn't always like this. In the early days, I used to look forward to Tuesdays. I would wash my hair on Monday afternoon. He would come to my bedroom for help with his English homework. I tell him to I'll tell him to warn his brothers and sisters not to go near the pole. He always does what I ask him. I won't say anything to the other children, so Iyashegi won't shout at me. Don't get me wrong. I don't hate Baba Segi. On the contrary, I have several reasons to be thankful to him. He gave me a place of refuge when the wicked of the world were ready to swallow me whole. You see, when the world owes you as much as it owes me, you need a base from which you can call in your debts. In return for his kindness, I have worked tirelessly to make him happy. I cook his favorite meals the way Grandma taught me. The people in this household are easy to please. Tad you lie that it was far Tad you lie that it was for easing life out of an ailing dog. When the poison turns her belly, Baba Segi will be forced to take her to her father's house. You can count on me, Yesegi. Evil doers should get what they deserve. The Bible says so. As soon as Iesegi left the kitchen, I tore at the bundle impatiently. The Lord is going to use me to conquer my enemy. The mantle of justice has fallen on me. Ha! I am blessed. It was like it was when she slept in the same room as Lara. She had lain there for what seemed like hours before she realized she was being kept away by the night noises. The air was steamy with an aphrodisiac. Every toad for miles was croaking its finest wind song, and in the Alao house, crickets serenaded one another in harmonizing duets. It was the exact location of this noise that Bonali was trying to decipher when she realized she was fully clothed. She changed into her nightgown and got on her knees. She crawled along the walls and pressed the nozzle of the insect killer, the narrow gap between the wall and the wooden skirting board. She could taste the insecticide at the back of her throat. You will know soon enough. Don't be in a hurry, evil spirit. Iyafemi let her laughter lose again. Then it is good that I did not eat it. I am glad it was Segi who ate it all. I am glad my lips did not touch food that was offered to me by hands that hit me. I am glad that Iyasegi, who had slipped back into her trance, sat up. Did you say Segi ate your chicken? Yes, she wanted it and I let her have it. I am not full of hate. Why should I deprive her of anything when she is a child and my husband's daughter? Before they could humiliate her further, Bolanli ran to her bedroom and locked the door behind her. Is it not to see you? Baba Segi didn't know where he was going with this, but he was suspicious all the same. Indeed they are, but they are also there because they have a common belief. Baba Segi opened his mouth to talk, but the doctor raised a solitary finger and stopped him before he started. They believe that I know what I'm doing. 
They believe that I don't just sit here making things up. They believe that when I ask them to do something, it is because I believe it is for their own good. After all, I did not drag them here from their homes. Did I? Well, there are no wells, no baths, no arguments, no questioning of my understanding of obstetrics and gynecology. He turned to Bodanley. Mrs. Alao, if you seek a solution, perhaps you can advise your husband. A sperm count has to be done. I think I need to talk to his other wives. Yep, that makes sense. Just say it. Part of the investigation. He can't argue with that. So you, so you agree that I shouldn't tell him the results yet? I think that's reasonable. Dr. Usman stood up, eager to return to his own department. The first thing that struck me about Baba Segi's house was the soiled curtains. The layer of dust on them was so thick that Grandma would have sliced the veins in my neck if she ever came home to find hers looking like that. Except her imported voile curtains wouldn't have been so vile anyway. The house girl would have washed them as soon as she left the pinch of the red harmattan winds. The walls of Babasegi's house were stained too. Everything was grubby, but the wives were the worst of all. The aging toad and the shameless goat. Omer ruled the pond and the other played with a shadow all day. And how they stank! If I really wanted to punish them, I would have turned them around and returned to Grandma's house immediately. But I decided to show mercy, especially after Baba Segi showed me my room. Ia Segi came to my room and told me how children were born in Baba Segi's household. She said it as if the solution wasn't out of choice, but necessity. When she left my room, I smiled to myself. I was already pregnant. Six months later, Baba Segi and I brought Femi home from the hospital. He's very big for a child born three months early, his first wife sneered. I told her the ways of God were mysterious and snatched my newborn son from her arms. <clears throat> Trade. The blood that runs through the daughters that Iatope brought into this home of mine is dirty. Her children are so sickly. Not long after Bolanle arrived, Iatope sat in the sitting room looking for pity. She likes to sit around the house plating her daughter's hair like a beggar in the marketplace. Motun had a fever that morning and Baba Segi insisted that she stay home. When her sisters heard that they would be separated from her, they sobbed and wept. Tope, the oldest, begged to stay at home so she could look after her sisters. The middle one, Afolake, strained and wriggled in her seat. I do not tolerate such rubbish, so I told the older two I would whip them all the way to their classrooms if they did not get into the bus. I don't understand these children of yours, I told Iatope. The affection they have for each other has become unhealthy. They are like forsaken triplets lost in the forest, crook, each unable to survive without the others. They want to eat from the same plate, wear the same hairstyle, speak with the same voice. Will they marry the same husband? After dropping the children at school, I returned home. As I stepped onto the veranda outside, I heard Bolanle asking Iatope if the child was better. Ah, if only desire didn't always carry trouble on its back. Now is not the time, I told myself. There is a time for everything. After a few moments of silence, Iyasegi sank into her seat as if she was being softened feet first in a pot of boiling water. She only stopped when her back was where her bottom should have been. Ah, Iyafemi, what have we done with our own hands? I told you the woman was a witch. Why was it tonight of all nights that Segi went to her room? She must have used spiritual water to wash her eyes. She must have known and forced Segi to eat the chicken. Both women looked at each other. They both knew no force was required where Segi's appetite was concerned. Did you use all of the powder? Perhaps it'll not have the potency Taju said it would have. Every grain of it, as you instructed. Don't worry, I know what to do. Early tomorrow morning, I'll go to the prophets in my church. 
They will fast and pray for three days. I am not a prophet, but God does not fail me. We will not lose a child in this household. Did you say lose a child? Do you realize what has just come out of your mouth? Iatope was trying to run the household because his mother was still not herself. Iafemi's bosom only welcomed her own children's heads a number of times. Aki knocked quietly on Bolanle's door, but ran away before she opened it. All right. The back of Segi's bald head was rhythmically slapping the bare terrazzo flooring. Her eyes had rolled upwards, revealing bright yellow eyeballs. Her tongue hung out to the side of her mouth, clasped into place by clenched teeth. Iyasagi woke from her slap-induced slumber and raced to her daughter's side. She wrapped her arms around Segi's belly and hoisted her into a sitting position. Segi! Segi! Iyatope yelled. It was a beseeching ball to a child dancing on the rim of a yawning well. Bolanle ran to, ran to the kitchen to fetch a bowl of water and returned with trembling hands. Iyatope dipped her hands into the bowl and sprinkled droplets on Segi's face while Iyafemi rubbed the young girl's left hand, hoping to restore warmth to it. The jittering eased into a rigidity that made Segi's toes lengthen and spread like a rake's fingers. Her arms straightened at the elbows and her neck extended out of her shoulders. Her face held a look of pain so glorious that it brought tears to the eyes of all four women. Then, after a long, deep breath, Segi exhaled all the life within her. All the tension and agony was suddenly gone from her face. Ah! Segi. <sighs> They say the elder who soils the floor will shit immediately forgets, but the stench remains in the memory of the person who has to scrape it up. Some people are born to shit and some like Bolanle and me are born to scrape. Bolanle should have known how much her arrival would change our household. I remember the very day she set her foot in this house because it was our sharing night. The night Iasegi distributed the week's provisions that evening, our mother of the home was quiet. The stone in her throat moved up and down like beads on a dancer's hip. Iafemi's head was hot. She wanted the blood of this new wife who had taken her place as the newest, youngest, freshest wife. My only worry was that Bonanle's arrival would disrupt the sex rotation. Baba Segi normally went from wife to wife Starting each week with Iasegi, by Thursday he'd start the cycle again, leaving him with the freedom to choose whom to spend Sunday night with. Baba Segi used this night to reward whichever wife had missed a night because of her menstrual flow. Sometimes a wife would have Sunday night if he knew he had been heavy-handed in scolding her. Most weeks, Iafemi got Sunday because she enticed him with her groundnut stew. Her okuru with shrimp sauce, her yam balls, and her awesome. The toilet roll sat on top of a pile of magazines. The cardboard cylinder revealed a naked woman's open legs. I wet the tissue and wiped off the streaks of blood on my thighs. I noticed that my skirt was still bunched together at my waist, so I freed the hem and ironed it down with wet palms. The man was dancing in his seat and singing along to the music in between cigarette puffs. It had stopped raining. He raced down the Oyo Road towards Agbo. Throughout the journey, I stared out of my window, trying to reconcile the person I was now with the girl who stood, cold and wet, beneath the Agbalumo tree. I caught my face in the wing mirror. Who are you? I asked myself. They escaped as soon as the sun warmed the top of my head. How could I hold it together when my destiny hung before me like the proverbial mangoes? Hear me, the king pronounced. The flesh of these big yellow mangoes gives eternal, eternal life. But beware, the tree has roots of poison. Only the strong and the brave can eat the mangoes and live. But could anyone boast of strength and bravery 
before they'd eaten the mangoes and lived. Ia Tope looked up at the older wife. She opened her mouth, but no words came out. She tried again, but her lips just opened and closed like a fish anticipating a maggot. Ia Segi, I have never desired blood in my life. Bolanli felt tears welling up in her eyes, but she blinked them back. Then why was this found in your bedroom? Baba Segi's voice was calmer now. He was beginning to see that things didn't quite add up, but he decided to see it through so he could observe her reaction. Stand up and come and see for yourself. I will not touch it. He sighed with relief when Bolanle crawled towards what someone had pushed beneath a stool. In a small calabash, there was a pool of once white thread, half immersed in a pool of blood. Unspeakable, Bolanle hissed. Perched on a crumbling concrete block by the sidewall, Iasegi remained still until several voices echoed her husband's call. I am here, my lord. This house is a mess. Clean it. Right away, my lord. Their voyeuristic thirsts quenched. Everyone got the message and began to agitate for a speedy exit. The spectacle had been gratifying. The outcome, glorious. Please write Mr. Ishola aloud. Baba Segi shouted now. I'm her next of kin. You should have stayed in your father's house if you wanted your mother to be your next of kin. Bolani raised a palm to her mouth to prevent any more words from flying out. She hadn't realized she'd said her mother's name. The nurse drew a line across what she'd written and started over. Her writing was swift, yet leisurely, clear and no sharp angles. She handed the empty folder to Balani, go to cubicle five. She pointed to the empty cubicle, even though the number was emblazoned on a white A4 sheet and tapped to the door. Baba Sekin kept his eye on the folder. Hold it tight, he mumbled. The doctor's eyes were bloodshot but they responded to every sound in the room. As soon as the couple walked in, he stood up to take the pink folder from Bolani and offered them the seats on the other side of the table. When will you be back home? It was still too early for him to return to anything related to doctors and hospitals. In the evening, probably around six, don't be late for family time. Iyasegi sat calmly in the pickup, but there was madness crawling beneath her skin. She had heard that people on the verge of traipsing naked into the streets often complained of a persistent march of arms all over their bodies. The truth was that it was Babasegi's joy that nibbled at her limbs, his smile pure and trusting, like that of the lambs skipping to the slaughterhouse. The instructions had not been complicated. Take this appointment card, Wake up early on Wednesday morning, dress yourself and accompany me to the doctors. If they ask you any questions, keep nothing from them. Iyasegi had etched out her own plan. There would be no questions, only answers. She wouldn't wait for the long rope of truth to be pulled from her. She would volunteer it willingly and without persuasion, even if it made Babasegi force his head through the hospital walls. The truth, they say, cannot hide his head forever. His tears hit the floor with a quiet splat. Is there anything you can offer you, sir? A soft drink, perhaps? Dr. Debbie asked. Dr. Osman mouthed the words, the words, let's leave him to his colleague and tiptoed out of the room. Dr. Debbie took all the sharp instruments from his table and hurried after him. If Bonande had known what lay in wait for her, perhaps she would, hadn't have dallied so long in the market, wandering from stall to stall. Before she spotted the small crowd gathered in front of her home, she smelt Mama Elepa's groundnuts burning. 
As Bonanle moved closer, she was sure she could make out Mama Elepa's fragile frame, bent over from decades of carting firewood on their veranda. Most of the women she saw were standing with their hands clasped behind their back. Some had their hands on their head and were hopping from leg to leg as if their bladders held them hostage. Saju was leaning against a pillar, scratching his chin. Iyasegi's voice was loudest. Oi, she yelled. Iyafemi was screaming in tongues. Iyatope had an arm around Segi, but the, la the arm was limp like a wet cloth. Segi's eyes were red from weeping. Everyone looked around nervously. She wants to kill him, Iyasegi pointed when Bolande was a few steps within the commotion. What did my father ever do to her? I'm not married yet. She wants to kill my father with Juju before he walks me down the aisle. Unspeakable, Bolande hissed. She turned and looked up at Baba Sege. Do you think so little of me? Baba Sege looked away, but Ia Sege would not let it go. It may not have been an intended thrust, but it hurts all the same. Mama, when did this happen? Just six days ago, I was slaving at work as I have always done. A mother must continue to do her duty to her children when suddenly I realized I couldn't hear what my colleagues were saying. I could see their mouths moving, but I couldn't hear their voices. The last thing I felt was the cold towels I'd been begging my boss to change. He could at least use some of the government money he embezzles to make his surroundings pleasing to the eye. His home must be just as dirty. Anyway, when I came to, I found myself in a bed at UCH. They said I should stay on, but I threatened to jump off the balcony if they did not let me return home. She looked around and shook her head. I should have told you earlier, Mama. I didn't want to upset her, I thought. Given her illness, she might be inspired to forgive me. And now your sister has followed the path you opened for her. What is left for me to live for? You know, I want God to take me so I can look him in the eye and ask why he gave me such wicked children. Mama, I do not want to quarrel. Even if we lie to each other every week, there will come a day where we must speak the truth. Bolandi, you are the biggest disappointed in the world has seen. You are ruined, damaged, destroyed. Note. God has turned his face from this house. Last night, Baba Seki brought news that threw the household into anguish. He told us that Seki's hair was falling out and that if she as much as brushed her hair, brushed her finger against her ear, her hair dropped onto the pillow like the feathers of a fowl, steeped in boiling water. To the uninformed ear, this might have sounded trivial, but in our house, it fermented the stomach content of all who heard it. Iatobe cried out first because she spent much of her time nurturing Segi's hair. She wailed that she had plated it since she joined this household. She doesn't have much to do with her time. You see. I went to church after I heard, but I was not uplifted. The candlelit altar and the candle lighting pastor looked ridiculous. The prophet stared at my breast for so long that I had to tell him not to defile me. But it wasn't until I got home that I realized how much his evil spirit had followed me. Do not let the devil smite me in my time of shame. <clears throat> the traffic on Songo Road had slowed to intermittent jerking. She seems happy and restful now. Baba Segi continued to his driver. The nightmares are gone. We have much to be grateful for. He was determined to embrace optimism. I examined together. We've already administered some tests on Mrs. Alao, so now you need to do some initial tests too. This will help us determine how we might overcome the difficulties he avoided using the word problems. I hope you are not trying to say that I might be the cause of, their, of these difficulties. But once I get glanced at Bolali, then moved his face as close to the doctor's. 
as the table would allow. Listen, doctor, I have many children. I have sons. I have daughters. The only thing God has not blessed me with is twins. Mind you, there's still time. So tell me, he paused. Are the tests you want to do on me not a waste of time? Dr. Dubia reclined into his seat and took off his glasses. He looked entered near Baba Sergio while his glasses swung from his finger like the wand of a matrimony. Mr. Alawu, did you see that queue out there? Yes, there are many people waiting outside the door. Good. Do you know why they are there? Hi, Ia Sagi. I was an enormous child. My mother said I made her back curve like a cat's tail. She said she didn't know what to do after my father left her, so she just ate and ate. After I was born, she consoled herself by eating more. She ate and ate, and what she couldn't eat, she rammed into my mouth until I was full, rolling on the floor, beckoning sleep. She said she was forced to wean me because I shamed her in front of her customers by demanding breast milk. Let me suck, I am hungry, I whined, to the surprise of the old women. My mother sent me to daycare the next day, like every other four-year-old. The food my mother ate seemed to toughen her. Her arms and legs could rival a man's for strength. She said so herself, and she was the only woman who turned fufu and sold it wholesale. My youth was filled with the smell of fermented cassava, my nails brittle from constant immersion in water. I never knew my father. <clears throat> my father left me for a beautiful woman. I told him I was pregnant, but he didn't want to hear it. He sliced me like okra and left. He pursued another woman's hole and died inside it, my mother said. Money has taken over her senses. She does not even care about bearing children. Thank you. Okay. Ah. The second evil thing that Iyasegi did was to banish Bonanli's friends from our house. After Yemisi and other friends visited for the third time, Iyasegi told our husband that they were bad role models for the daughters in the family, especially her daughter, Segi, who was at an impressionable age. Papa Segi jumped at the notion as if he had been looking for a reason to keep Bonanli for himself alone. He told Bonanli that he didn't want unmarried women near his doorstep. Bonanli received Baba Segi's instructions without a word. She never once looked at her husband with annoyance. She just said she had things to buy at the market and quietly slipped out of the house. Iya Segi was wrong about the skin of educated types. The more those two put Bonanli, the more mercy her eyes showed, the more her hands opened to the children. And I have never known anyone like Bonanli before. Even after two years of their wickedness, she still greets them every morning. What more do you want? I should tell her to be careful, but I can't. I am afraid of these women. I will just keep quiet and watch. What else can a sheet scrapper do? Your forms, please, he said, motioning to me. I handed them over to a nurse holding out her hand. The doctor's fingers were long and his nails were bitten into the cuticles. He flashed me a reassuring smile as he splattered a globule of gel onto my belly. He called out numbers and letters to the nurse. She repeated everything he said and filled out the blank spaces on the forms. Turn on to your left side, please, the doctor requested. He held out his arm, he held out his arm so I could grasp it to change position. He pressed my belly with three fingers. It was mildly uncomfortable, but I did not let out a sound. When the examination was complete, he told me to change in the adjoining room. I summoned all my strength and stumbled through the open door. The first thing I saw was my reflection in the mirror above the sink. I touched my face, thankful that the swelling was hardly noticeable. What I had hoped to say for my husband had been wrenched from me and all I had to show for it was an excruciating ache and disheveled hair. When I rested my arms on my breasts to button up my blouse, I felt how tender they were. I took a peek 
and found fading teeth marks all over them. Ia Femi, your father and mother are gone. The man whose lips mouthed these words was my uncle, my father's only sibling. His eyes were bloodshot and swollen. He had lived with us for as long as I could remember. When my father went into the deep forest to hunt bushmeat, it was he who watched over me and my mother. My mother didn't need watching over. Whenever my father stepped out of the house, she sat on the porch and wove baskets until he returned. <clears throat> Many people who are older than you have not tasted the sweet life you have enjoyed since birth. Your parents should be ashamed. The ugly witch shook her head. I do not know when and how my teeth found her ear, but they refused to unclench, even as blood dripped from her lobe into my mouth. My uncle heard the wailing from where he was hiding and ran to her rescue. The hand pestle my uncle used to knock my mouth open broke one of my front teeth. I didn't care. What was half a tooth to half an ear? She would think twice before speaking ill of my parents again. St. Gabriel's ultrasound center was not what I expected. The building was in a small compound near me too, and it was a sign that pointed visitors in the direction of the, to the top floor. The front wall was decorated with large stones cemented together, so it looked as if the building had, has been sculpted from a mountain of granite. From the gate, I saw women sitting on benches, their bags leaning heavily um, against the iron railings that enclosed the balcony. There was a chemist on the ground floor where a gar garage should have been put but no windows shed light on it, boxes of tablets. That's me, I said. Standing up hurriedly, my, my forms fell from my arm, from my lap. Go to the room, dear. Go to room three and wait until you are invited. The nurse frowned and I I the forms as I retrieved them from the floor, as if to be certain that I picked up every single one. The doctor was pleasant looking, his chin jutted out slightly, giving his face a glum appearance. The armpits of his eye, um, tie dye shirt were darkened from a pass, pass, pass friction, <laughs> even though cool air was blowing from a nosy air conditioning until he entered into his rectangular hole in the wall. His eyes did not leave the scan on it all. Baba Segi yelled frantically as he scrambled down the corridor to Bolanle's room. Iasegi, help me. I can't find Bolanle. We were supposed to go to hospital today. Where is she? What have you lost, Baba Segi? Iasegi flung the door room open. It's Bolanle. She's gone. She must have run away in the middle of the night. All the money I've spent on her is wasted. My graduate is gone. One leg was in his trousers. The other was caught in the waistband, so he was hopping along, sweat dripping from his bare chest. Have you looked in her bedroom? Iasegi tried to join in the panic, but her words came out too slowly, too comfortably. I've looked everywhere. These educated girls, they take your money and then they abandon you. Only after clearing his digestive system could Baba Segi remain calm. Once when his shop assistants came to tell him that his shop had been burgled, he listened attentively while they read out the list of what had been stolen. Then, tensing his buttocks, he strode to the toilet. Within minutes, he reappeared, with all tension gone from his face. All I can say is, what happened has happened. This was not the philosophical response the perplexed employees expected. They still looked at each other and wondered if Baba Shegi was still suffering from shock. I knew it was Cole's birthday when I woke up this morning, but rather than congratulate mother and son, I slipped out of the house and headed to the diagnostic clinic to collect the results of my blood tests. On the way there, I bought Cole a remote control car. 
Boxed and gift wrapped, the toy was heavier than I thought it would be, so I changed hands every time my wrist ached. I didn't want to return to Baba Segi's house yet. I was pursued by the rat head episode and I felt an unmistakably unmistakable homeward draw. I decided to go to my parents' house. If I wasn't so embarrassed, I would have visited my friends if only to apologize. I'd hidden in my bedroom when Baba Segi told them that their foolishness was not welcome in our home. I sent your sister to you, but she said she would rather drown than stop at your husband's house. She must have seen the shock on my face. Your sister is not what she used to be. No, that is a lie. She's exactly what she used to be. She's tried to stand, but her left thigh shuddered and shook. There is no room for me in her mind. It's just one man after the other. We do not know which one it is at any given time, she sighed. She too says she's found herself a husband. Anyway, there I was, probed up by one of the walls at Bodija Market when a man asked me if I knew Jesus. From the little time I'd spent in primary school when my parents were alive, except her imported voile curtains, who wouldn't have been so vile anyway, the house girls would have washed them as soon as she felt that pinch of the red Hamilton Hormet, winds. The walls of Baba Seji's house were stained too. Everything was grubby, but the wives were worst of all. The aging toad and shameless goat. One ruled the pond, the other played with its shadow all day. And how they stank. If I'd really want to punish them, I would have turned around and returned to Grandma's house immediately, but I decided to show mercy, especially after Baba Seji showed me in my room. I was 23, yet I had never had my own room before. I slept between parents until the day they died. I looked at the double bed and tested the softness of the mattress with both palms. I would have been a fool not to lie on it, even if it was just for one night. I now know why rich people slept longer than pa paupers. When I woke up the next morning, I felt like I was suspended in mid-air. It was as if I had reached my heaven. Not even God himself could have made me leave Baba Sage's house after that. Thank you. Polygamist. I didn't just happen upon this room. I dreamt of the pale green walls before I arrived. Now, the built-in wardrobe is mine, and so is the ceiling fan. My window looks over a backyard with patchy but neatly trimmed grass. Damp clothes flap in the evening breeze and perfume the air with detergent. On the back wall, an iron drum is darkened from burned refuse. A tap juts from the grass and a weathered concrete slab lies beneath it. At that moment, a blazing sun ray struck the darkened glass and filtered into the room through a small chip. The chip broke the beam with its jagged edges and scattered embers all over the room. One landed on my foot like a fallen firefly. Then the sun crept behind a cloud and everything dissolved into hot air. But the chip remained secretly concealing its radiance behind the small crack, shaped like the tick of a tentative hand. I took it as a sign. I was home. Will you women gape at my new wife until I starve to death? Baba Segi asked. Not in this lifetime, my lord, the eldest wife, Iaseji, moved quickly for one so generously proportioned. The floor shuddered with her every step. The other wives scurried after her. The decision was easy and was met, as I expected, with understanding. I knew Baba Segi didn't want me to leave, but the recent revelations had left him without a viable alternative. It was more important to him, as Iasegi had understood, that his manhood be protected. An agreement was drawn up. They could stay if they promised to be the wives he wanted them to be. He promptly banned them from leaving the house without his permission. 
Iasegi was instructed to close down all her shops and relinquish every kobo she had saved to him. Iafemi was forbidden to wear makeup and there would be no more church. God hears your heart no matter where you are, he'd said. Surprisingly, he didn't want, want surprisingly, he didn't have any rules for Iatope. Rather, he came to favor her and now decided to spend most of his nights with her. In return, Babasegi swore to buy them all the jewelry, all the lace, every luxury they needed and wanted, provided these were, the on, these were only worn within the four walls of the home. On the day, he called a meeting to lay down these new laws. Everyone was given the opportunity to respond. Iasegi sobbed silently. And she said she was just grateful for Babasegi's graciousness. Iatope smiled. His words greatly satisfied her. Iafemi launched into prayer and asked that God bless Babasegi with the riches of Solomon. When it was my turn, I, I simply said I thought about it and decided to return to my parents' house. Babasegi was taken aback. He asked if he had offended me in any way. I told him he had not and explained that there was no point staying if I wouldn't be able to give him children. He listened attentively and promised that he would always be there to give me anything I ever needed. I saw the sadness in his eyes. It was as if it had just dawned on him that our paths had just crossed for a purpose, but we were never meant to be together. Of course, I couldn't tell him that I felt as if I'd woken up from a dream of unspeakable self-flagellation. It started a few days after Segi died. I'd walk through the house and feel as if I was in the midst of strangers, people from a different time in history, a different world. I didn't feel soiled anymore. The other thing was that a young girl had died for sins that were not hers. Segi came to my mind too frequently. I couldn't get the picture of her dying next to me out of my head. Perhaps she would still be alive if I'd never come to Baba Segi's home. Then again, Baba Segi would never have known about his wives and their deceit. I will remember Baba Segi. I won't miss him, but I will remember him. Perhaps on some days I will remember him with fondness. I have learnt many things from the years I spent under his roof. It was being in his house that shook me awake. I will be thankful for that. The wives will be relieved by my departure, I know. Maybe not Iatope, but the other two will remember me as the wicked wind that upturned the tranquility of their home. When they talk about me, they will console one another by calling me the uppity outsider, the one who couldn't cut it, as an alao wife. I will remember them as inmates because what really separates us is that I have rejoined my life's path. They are going nowhere. One after the other, they offered to help me gather my belongings, but I told them I could manage. There wasn't much left to pack anyway. Much of it was never unpacked. Akin offered too. Even if I'd said no, he, he wouldn't have listened. He helped me load up the waiting taxi. He stood alone by the gate and waved until I was out of sight. Don't think I can't see the challenges ahead of me. People will say I'm a second-hand woman. Men will hurt and ridicule me, but I won't let them hold me back. I will remain the land of the living. I am back now, and the world is spread before me like an egg cracked open. Hello, my name is Lola Shone, and I'm the author of The Secret Lives of Babasegi's Wives. I want to say a huge thank you to you for choosing my novel for the Google Africa Reads Challenge. I have devoted most of my adult life to promoting literacy through being a school teacher, but also dreaming up innovative means of putting books authored by Africans in the hands of African readers. Books are wonderful. Not only do they help us develop empathy, but they are extremely helpful in navigating the complexity and the diversity of our beautiful continent. If you're interested 
in joining this challenge but don't have the book yet, you can now access the ebook and the audiobook read by me on the One Read app. Happy reading! Thank you.